Hey, Cypher here. Today I wanted to do a bit of a thought piece on the idea of agency in history. This is another one of those kinds of things that historians kind of grapple with but never really talk about in uh, their writing. You see, the core idea of agency is just how much will your characters, i.e., you know, people, are exerting on the story that you're telling. Is history happening to them? or are they creating history by themselves? And this would seem to be something that would just be dictated by evidence, right? Just what somebody says about why they did something has a lot to do with, well, why they did something, right? But it's not really that simple at all. In fact, if you're putting it in those parameters, it's kind of not grasping the concept at all. So the whole thing with agency is, who is exerting influence on the story that you're telling? A lot of great man history depends on, you know, great men doing great things. They are the ones making history. But there's a reason why great man history has been maligned so heavily in recent years. Basically, it makes it sound like these great men are somehow the only ones controlling what happens in reality. But everyone is ultimately a free agent. Anyone you ever talk about is exerting their own will in some way. But when talking about this kind of stuff, inevitably you have to have like a protagonist who is the person that you are focusing on. And they're the one doing things, whereas everyone else is just reacting to them. So giving people agency can often just be saying that they have some will of their own. In my field of work, American violence, this is actually kind of a difficult issue because, well, the person who is exerting influence is also the person who is wielding violence. So if you're talking about like an Indian massacre or something like that, how do you give agency to the victims? So let's get to a very concrete example. The Vegas shooting. I've been pretty involved in a lot of the uh, scholarship on that specific issue. And it gives us a very obvious opportunity to give voice to the victims. Because UNLV, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, I'm an alumni by the way, they are collecting oral histories of the event and the surrounding history of it. The individual experiences of that day and what happened afterwards. And so you can give voice to those victims by just using what they have said as, well, here's what happened that day, here's what they experienced, and here's how they are going on with their lives. Oh, come on, I gotta have a good example here. One that I haven't used already. But when dealing with history, oftentimes you can't just go and talk to the victims. Emphasizing victims' narratives is pretty important when talking about this kind of stuff and giving them agency. But what happens when everybody's been long dead? This is about the Ludlow Massacre. And even though this book is incorrectly subtitled as America's Deadliest Labor War, that would be the Mingo War by far. This thing, this doesn't even count. Andrews doesn't just depict it as a massacre, but shows that it was a larger war. And so in this book, it is specifically talking about trying to subvert that narrative of the Ludlow Massacre. He says, The perpetuation of the Ludlow as massacre story distorts our ability to understand the tumultuous relationship between mine workers, mine operators, and the state. By showing that Ludlow is just part of a larger whole, he is able to talk about the mine workers and their families in reaction and prior to the event itself, the, the Ludlow Massacre. In a sense, he is giving agency to the victims of the massacre. The problem is, as with all of these things, those who die don't get a voice. How do you tell the story 
of victims, of victims who can no longer tell their story. And to be honest, I don't really have an answer for that. Because while you can talk about people exerting violence as a form of agency, that they are trying to do something, they are the ones exerting agency. And so one of the great issues of historians of violence is with folks like this is that you often end up only talking about the killers or the combatants, but their victims, often women and children, they only enter the story as victims. And how do you give agency to somebody who is dead but cannot speak? You know, violence is very much a gender issue, but oftentimes we can't really talk about it without just talking about it from one side. Where is it? The closest to giving agency to victims that I have seen is Roger McGrath, who studies specifically two towns which were both considered to be in California, but turned out that Aurora was actually in Nevada. One is Bodie and one is Aurora. And he really digs into the violence of these particular areas, specifically all the different kinds of violence, and he divides it. In fact, he has an entire chapter labeled Women, Juveniles, and Violence. Women and Children. And in that chapter, he talks about women who commit violence themselves, of course, but he also talks about domestic violence, which surprisingly was actually recorded pretty thoroughly. And in a lot of these cases of domestic battery, women were actually suing their husbands. So that is pretty good data and it gives us their voice. And a lot of agency is about giving voice. Because ultimately everyone is acting and trying to do the best they can. And so it's important to depict that. But something that a lot of historians are kind of hesitant to talk about is that agency can go too far. You know, it's great to give voice to the voiceless and all that kind of stuff. There's a whole field of study called subaltern studies that is trying to elevate the voices of those who have been repressed. But other times, historians kind of go back to that great man narrative to say like, ooh, look at this person and what he was trying to do, he's so evil. You especially see this with economic analysis, where basically people show that you know, some tycoon is benefiting from this horrible thing that was done and, you know, obviously they were trying to do it. Ludlow may be an example of how historians have tried to depict it as something that Rockefeller was very much trying to execute people because, oh, they're miscreants. But at that point, that's giving too much agency to people. There's this idea in philosophy called a razor. The idea is basically that you can cut away a bunch of different arguments and get to the closest thing to the truth. Most people think of Occam's razor, as in the simplest argument is the best. But when dealing with agency, there's another razor that's actually kind of just pop philosophy, but I don't really care about the difference. It's called Hanlon's razor. A rager. That sounds fun. It's called Hanlon's Razor. And the basic idea is don't attribute to malice what you can attribute to stupidity. You know, were the people who were killed in Ludlow killed out of malice or out of stupidity? And this isn't just something about individual incidents of massacres. We can take it all the way to the nuclear bomb. Was the nuke dropped out of malice or stupidity? Did the US know any better? This book talks about, well, the exhibit of the Enola Gay at the Smithsonian. And it never actually happened, but it became so controversial because they were basically trying to say that the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, mostly Hiroshima, since obviously it's about the Enola Gay, was out of fear of the yellow peril. 
Now this book that I'm waving around is actually like pretty happy with the exhibit. I'm not. While it tried to tell the story from the victim's perspective, what they were doing was trying to insert maliciousness on the behalf of Truman and the rest of his administration as opposed to, you know, trying to do as best they can. Often, people act out of confusion. Sure, they could have detonated the bomb somewhere else. They could have tried to be more diplomatic in between the two bombs or whatever. But they had two bombs to use and an ongoing war. So they made a decision, not based on hate, but based on practicality. They didn't have all the answers, so it was based upon stupidity, confusion. The first paper I ever published, which was in a UNLV publication, was called A Study in Confusion. It was about the Russian intervention of 1918 and 1920, and specifically, it was about our decision to intervene. Hi, George F. Kennan. Actually, if you want a better book to read on the subject, I'd highly recommend this book that was based on Kennan's book, but, um, you know, is a lot more fun to read. But the title of this book should be a pretty clear indicator of our intentions. We didn't know what we were doing. Now, if you go back to my episode on the Russian intervention of 1918 and 1920, you will find a lot of comments talking about like, well, of course it was about communism, or you don't know what you're talking about, it was only about World War I. Well, if it was only about World War I, why did it go past World War I? And if it was only about communism, why did we support communists at separate times? The fact is, we really didn't have any clue what we were doing, and most of the scholarship points to that. Now something I didn't get to talk about in that video, or the Kennan video, is that my work was obviously based on primary sources. And here's a weird thing, even though I would love to hate on Wilson, he was just basically following the British on this. Yeah, the American decision to intervene was actually based on the British decision to intervene. So, whatever reason is given by Wilson's aid memoir doesn't really matter. What really matters is what the British were saying in those cabinet meetings. And so I actually opened up those cabinet meetings to Americans at least, and went through their digital archives. And what I found was that there were some people, like Churchill, saying like, yeah, let's go get them reds. And then there were people like Lord Kurtzon, who was more like, look, guys, let's take this easy, let's be careful, let's be cautious. And then sometimes you get some random person walking into the meeting and not even understanding that Murmansk and Siberia are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles apart from each other. It was amazing how stupid these meetings were. High-ranking officials who are making the decision to intervene and have no goddamn clue what the heck they're doing. To quote Lloyd George in his actual affirmation of the confusion surrounding this decision, he said he had found himself frequently leaning first in one direction and then in another, owing to the absolute contradiction between the information supplied from Russia by men of equally good authority. We were, in fact, never dealing with ascertained or perhaps even ascertainable facts. Russia was a jungle in which no one could say what was within a few yards of him. In any case, nothing could be worse than having no policy, and it was better to proceed resolutely on a wrong hypothesis than to go on hesitating as the Allies had been doing. Lloyd George basically said, eh, I don't know what we're going to do, so let's invade the heck out of him anyways. And think about the ramifications of that decision. They chose to invade Russia for no better reason than, eh, and then they basically ended up planting the seeds for the Cold War? Seriously, at least in my interpretation, the Cold War began with the invasion of Russia, and it's all based on stupidity. 
these guys had no clue what they were doing. And that's the whole point of Hanlon's razor. We need to be able to separate out what was willingly malicious attacks and what was based on stupidity. Because oftentimes we talk about something like Indian massacres as if it was purely malicious, that it was solely based on race and that it had nothing to do with, you know, people acting stupidly. And that's the problem with giving too much agency to people. It denies the idea of confusion. And confusion is definitely something that everybody experiences. So either you have to give voice to the voiceless and promote that they are acting of their own volition, but then also end up giving too much agency to people, or you have to say, well, we can't speak for people who died and, you know, they're victims, so, you know, they only answer the story as victims. But then you also get to say, well, a lot of things are confusing and people act stupidly. And you see how this is kind of a fundamental issue to how we talk about history. And yet, it's not something that you can solve. It's kind of up to the person telling the story. People will often talk about history as being just the facts as they are, but that's not dealing with these kinds of fundamental issues. In science, you don't have to deal with trying to interpret people's will. In social sciences, they like to pretend that that's not really a thing, that people are only driven by incentives or something along those lines. But in history, you don't get to play those games. In history, you have to deal with evidence. And the problem is, because of evidence, as a historian, you don't get to take a particular position. You can advocate agency as much as you want, but eventually you have to acknowledge that people will act out of stupidity rather than agency. We are neither automatons nor completely rational actors.